but are you ready for rapid fire? Let's go. Rapid right. fire. Ready to go. Here we go. Fill in the blank. Notre Dame getting a commitment from Fort Wayne's Bronte Johnson this weekend is blank. Is a much needed boost to the defensive recruiting in the class of 24. So that's a big blank that I just filled. Uh, but that was huge. I mean, it was huge, not only for the safety position, but also for the defense. Now there's still some big time defensive players out there on the board. Uh, and if you are a member of the, of the Irish breakdown boards champion lounge, then you saw the recruiting update and there's still some defensive guys out there who I think Notre Dame has a decent chance at. So there's still a chance to beef up this defensive side, but that was a huge, 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 uh, commitment by Bronte Johnson for Notre Dame, no doubt. I mean, big time. And, you know, this is a position that we've been talking about they needed a hit at, that they needed to get a hit at this position yeah. at some point. And so not only do they get a hit, he becomes the highest rated defensive prospect, according to, you know, the 24-7 composite service. He's there, becomes right now the, the highest rated of any of the defensive players and he's number three in the class cj carr at number one cam williams at number two so this is a big hit at a big position yeah. of need and you know they they've kind of hit here in the last couple of weeks you know the, the the other guy last week you know a little bit more of a project than this guy and even even bronte johnson hasn't played as much safety because he's played more wide receiver but a really good athlete yeah. he gives them some size back there so yeah, and I know, you know, like Derek says, don't follow those chump services. I still, you know, it's like you got to, you know, just just looking at the rankings. And I know the rankings vary, you know. It like, gives you an idea of at least where yeah, we're like, talking like about, though. Brian and Ryan don't necessarily put out, you know, those kind of rankings. or You know, so I'm just using it as a point of reference. Right. It, it's a big one. And again, they needed it. And they keep, you know, Brian, Brian said a couple of weeks ago, just wait. Just wait. Bigger things are coming. And lo and behold, what happened? Got a big one. Got the biggest right. Got the biggest commitment on the defensive side of the ball so far for this right. class. Got to so. let it play out. They're, they're, like I said, there's some big fish out there still uh, that could really make this class uh, a primo class, a top five class when it's all said and done. So yeah. let's see what happens. Decaf18 says he works in an RV factory in Middlebury. Sounds like you might be our guy there. Let's Decaf, go, man. Like, I don't know what you're waiting for. <laughs> Come on board. There's a spot like right here. Yep. We can put a logo. We can, you know. Your RV company. I'm just saying. Just saying. Uh, Michael says, aren't 90% of the RVs in this country manufactured in Elkhart County? You're, yes. I don't know if that percentage I, I'm is. Not, yeah, but it's a lot. Accurate, but it's a lot. Yes. The, the RV Hall of Fame is is here, so I know that. So they wouldn't. Every time I here. head toward Cleveland to see Jesse, we drive right by yep. you know a bunch of those RVs on the yes, way out. Yes, sir. Of town. So there's RVs, and then all the companies that support the RV industry are around here. Yep. All right. So first question was an easy one. Yes, it was. This next one. This next one. Oh, yeah. So probably saw over the weekend. The Twitter account pre-snap, which is, as they say, the home of all 22 game film, tweeted a video of Irish receivers coach Chancey Stuckey doing a drill with his guys this spring where they stand on one foot, jump over a hurdle, they kind of come to balance, jump back over the hurdle, and then they take off running downfield, catch a pass. I guess it unsurprisingly has generated a lot of Twitter backlash. Here's a sampling of some of the Twitter backlash that it got. One from Bud Elliott, speaking of 24-7. He said, honestly, whatever works after how trash Notre Dame receivers were last year. Felt like that was a little... A little harsh. Felt a little personal there from, from Bud. Yeah, especially coming reason. from somebody who does this for a living. <laughs> right. You know, like, come on, dude. Right. Yes. Um, some This one from a self-proclaimed expert who goes with train, goes by train with Lane, SMH, shake my head. This is why, as specialists, we are needed. These drills are garbage, he says. Some other experts. The reason Chase Claypool hasn't broken out yet is God. because it takes three years to unlearn these trash drills. Big year four coming. Uh, another one. Why are some coaches obsessed with false starts? There's like 900 other things more important. And the last one, even though there were more, I'm just, you know, the last example that I've got. 
football position coaches need to devote more time to studying the science on drills that translate into game performance. Football is the stone age as far as sports performance training that translates. Some of these drills are simply ridiculous. Okay, Vince, fair or foul, all this criticism. You can criticize any drill. Um, any drill that any coach does with any group, you can criticize or find an issue with it or whatever. So whatever. I mean, that's fine. To say that, for example, this drill is why Chase Claypool hasn't broken out in the NFL is one of the most ridiculous statements I've ever heard. Number one, Chase Claypool did informed. not have Chancey Stuckey as his coach. He had the guy that yeah. is probably the reason maybe it's taking right. a little bit longer. The guy who wasn't de- who wasn't focusing right. on things like like balance getting off and balance explosion and, off the line. and yeah. false steps and all of those things. Right. I watched the drills that were being done when Chase Claypool was here, and it was the same drills every single day. Mm-hmm. And I did read a comment from somebody in that long thread at one point, and he said that, you know, you got to change up the drills to keep the interest level of the players, right? That's the one time I ever saw that drill that he did with them. Now, I'm not at every practice. But it's not the same drills over and but over and over. It's one drill in the Correct. middle of spring, and this Twitter account happened to grab right. it off someone's, you know, other Twitter account who was there and so it's one drill in spring. It's a five minute period in the spring. Correct. You know, again, we don't know how many times they ran it, but it was one of many, many right. drills. It's not like this is the only thing they were doing all spring long. Yeah. And I, you know, look. Is it good for balance? Yes. You're telling me that a wide receiver doesn't have to have balance? Because if you are telling me that, Mr. Specialist, the guy that you read from, who's just promoting himself, by the way, with that comment, that's why we need specialists. We don't need a specialist wide receiver coach that we have to pay you money on the outside, as opposed to my coach, who is at a D1 college. Like, this most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, number one. Uh, Number two... Somebody also said something about you should never have a drill where you go backwards if you're a wide receiver. Okay, I could get on board with that. That's fine. But again, this is about balance, then it's about explosion, and it's about not having that false step. Is not having a false step the most important thing that you can learn? No. But guess what? But every single coach at the high school level, even at the middle school level, teaches you stance and start and how to get out of a stance without having a false step. And why is that? Because you need every advantage that you can have. And if you don't have a false step, you're getting out of your stance quicker. It's just it's exactly. ridiculous. Milliseconds count. Absolutely. And if you're going to break a press, you know, like you have to be able to get off it. And especially it at this level, thing? milliseconds no, it, mean everything. Yes. Yes. It's still, it, it, it can't be discounted. And, you know, just like some of the garbage that you said. And I was just amazed, you know, because like I went through like this pre-snap feed and there were a bunch of other different, you know, from different schools and drills and stuff like that. None of them, got, none of them seemed to get, you of know, the, the kind of vitriol that this thing got. And again, you know, like the whole thing with Chase Claypool, like Chase Claypool had the guy before Ch- Chase Claypool had the guy who's the reason Chancey Stuckey is here, <laughs> you know, like exactly. he didn't have the guy focusing on the little things. And again, you know, like to blow up, to blow up one drill from the middle of spring practice that happens to be the drill that you show up, you know, that, that right. it's, it's just amazing that that's, you know, that, that, that blew up into that, but you know, balance is important for a wide receiver. And like you said, you know, maybe like the going backwards, but still he goes forwards, he stops and balances, goes back, balances mm-hmm. again, and then, takes off downfield it's you know again it's like one little drill in the right. middle of spring i see no problem with it i would rather see them be, you know be, it's it's just those little things lead to big things yeah and exactly it's it, like it, it was a bunch is. yeah a bunch of so-called experts trying to uh tell chancy stuckey who by the way not only was a receiver in the nfl and may know what he's talking about but also is coaching up a pretty talented group of wide receivers right now well, and like, you know, again, like saying that the receivers last year were trash, like, did you watch the quarterback who was right in the habit of throwing the ball into the ground or overthrowing receivers or would just completely 
you know, not look at receivers because he was locked in on an All-American tight end. I mean, we all know Michael Mayer was great. Right. But we also know that the ball need to be distributed better. You know, like that's – I mean, if anything, I think we, 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 we can all agree. Anyone who watched Drew Pine last year, the biggest thing was he locked in on Michael Mayer yeah, too much. Exactly. It wasn't the receiver's fault. The guy distributing the ball has to, you know, be willing to throw it. Super chat Woo! from Really Q. Really Q. Okay. Sam Hartman throws for over 3,000 yards, 25 touchdowns, and 10 interceptions. Above or below your expectations. How's the team doing with those stats? That'll I'd be... say they're all below. Like the interceptions, yeah, yeah. that's right well, there. I mean, that's that's the limit I would like to see. That's you know, max. The... That's max. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the other max. two, 3,000 and 25, I think are both low. I do too. I think I'm looking at like three thirty five hundred and about thirty five, thirty to thirty five touchdowns. And to be honest, if it's three thousand and twenty five, I think the interceptions are probably going to be higher than that because yeah. that's going to be you know what I mean. That's going to be kind of a a symptom. I so guess. this this is if he does that, I think we're looking at a nine and three, ten and two record. Yeah, I would concur. So crying belly was in here stirring things up earlier. And I know people were, were getting all over him, but he, he said, at what point do you guys think taking transfer quarterbacks impacts quarterback recruiting? So of all the junk that he was saying, and he just must be a very, just, I don't know. He, he leads a negative life, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but of all the stuff that he was saying, this is a legitimate question. And that's why I have no problem answering it. I think this is a legitimate right. question. So Notre Dame brings in Jack Cohn two years ago, brings in uh, Sam Hartman this year, right? I would say so far it hasn't affected recruiting at all. Because if you look at the recruits that have come in since then, you've got Kenny Minchie, you've got CJ Carr, and I believe Notre Dame is is in the mix for a very good quarterback in twenty five as well. So you're gonna have, you're gonna be stacking three pretty stinking good quarterbacks on top of each other, while you also have a transfer quarterback at the helm of this team, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we can all be in agreement that they're probably going to bring in a transfer quarterback for twenty four as well, and yet you still have stacked three groups of quarterbacks together or three classes of quarterbacks together. And you're look you're you're in pretty good shape. So I don't think it really has anything to do with it. Now, if you continue to do bring in transfers, maybe it affects some things. But here's the here's the reality of the situation. Kenny Minchie, CJ Carr, and whoever they bring in in 25, not all three of those guys are going to be multi-year starters at Notre Dame. That's just not physiologically possible, right? So somebody's going to transfer out. Now you've got a hole in the roster, so you've got to bring somebody in. The transfers are just the reality of college football now. That's what you have to remember. Yes, and I agree with what Anthony is saying. Sometimes they're going to have to develop their own guys, and that's absolutely that was that was my that was my because I know a lot of people as soon as things went south, losing the first two games of the season last year people were like oh you should have brought in that you know they should have brought in a transfer well at some point they were going to have to go with someone who lacked experience and they started off the season with Tyler Buckner Tyler got hurt again wasn't great even the first couple games when he wasn't hurt but at some point you were going to have to play some but you know and it's it's the same right now going forward at some point Someone who doesn't have a lot of experience is going to have to take some very meaningful snaps. So that is, you know, part of this equation on whether or not, like this year, you were either going to go with Tyler Buckner or you were going to go with what you ended up with. They obviously decided at the end of last season that they had an opportunity to get a much more experienced quarterback and that's the way they rolled. And it was going to turn into you know, more development for Tyler Buckner. Like in right. his case specifically, I understand why he decided to leave, but I don't understand why he went where he went, but still. No. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah, that's that's a completely different question right. altogether, is him going where he went because there's even more competition for the job going there. But right. I mean, that is they do have to weigh that. They have to way developing their own guys and again 
you get through this season with where Angeli and Kenny Menchie are, that's going to be part of, you know, weighing into your decision in December and going into the off season. Do we want right. to take on another quarterback? And then you also have Carr coming in, you know, and like how that factors into it. They, they you know, they're, they're going to have to weigh all that. I mean, you're absolutely right. It could ultimately impact that, but for right now, I still think they're okay. A lot of it is going to rest on what happens with these. Absolutely. Young guys, if they At can show that they can develop one guys. or two of these guys or whatever it happens to be, yeah. they're going to be fine. I, again, the transfer portal is a reality in college football right now, no matter what position you play. And so, I mean, that and, and kids know that that's a reality of college football. So, yep. you know, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that part. So another super chat. Keep Estime a big bulldozer and use him spread across the game or get more lean and have him an almost every down back less power. Could he even do that? So, so those are <laughs> options for you. So, so you either option. make him a big bulldozer, use him in a whole game or get more lean and have an almost every down back. I mean, you have both of those things in your running back room right now. So – the answer is yes. I mean, that's <laughs> right. I mean, you you have both body styles in your running back room right now. You don't have to pick one or the other because you have both. And they're going to use both. They're not going to use estimate the entire time. Yeah, I don't think, you know, he's he's never going to get 90% of the carries because they're, no. they're, they want to split it with at least another guy. And again, you go back to Dylan McCullough, you know, talking about the list of eight different jobs right. he has for the running backs. And he wants to use as many, like if he can... If he can find a way to get all five of those guys on the field this season, he'll do it. I think. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think you, you just you're gonna do all of the above. I mean, because you got to throw different, gonna throw different things at a defense. You got to throw the big bruiser. You got to throw the shifty guy. You got to you know all, all the guy that catch balls out of the backfield. Um, it, this is college football in 2023. You don't have bell cow backs anymore. Like that just doesn't really, it's not really a thing per se. Uh, you know, Blake Corum, maybe uh, up in Michigan, but he can't take as many uh, carries as he did last year coming off that injury. I mean, that's just not going to work. Right. And and you could argue that that injury had a lot to do with how many times he touched the ball last year. Right. So you you just can't have those bell cow backs anymore. That's just not the way college football is. Mm hmm. Fill in the blank. It's blank that Brian Kelly tweeted this yesterday. Headed to Omaha for the first time to watch LSU baseball play for the championship. That is, you know what that screams to me? I want to be like Marcus Freeman. <laughs> like, that's what that is. He's like, I man, look at all the publicity that Marcus Freeman is getting. I got to do this too. He's a front runner. Oh. He's a front runner is what he is. Yeah, Terrible. Maybe he doesn't want to be, but you know, because there was a picture of him and the family, I think, you know, get uh, whoever was in the group getting ready to get on the plane there in Baton Rouge. This is my point. So he did this yesterday. You know, they played at three o'clock yesterday afternoon. He did this yesterday morning. They're flying up there to the game. That was LSU's seventh game in Omaha. Exactly. Since they've been there in a week. Like in 2008, when Paul Maneri took LSU to the College World Series for the first time, you know, the first time he took them to, to the College World Series, the year before they won the national championship, I was there. I was in the press box. And you know who else was there? Les Miles, the football coach. He was there opening weekend. He didn't wait yep. until championship weekend to show up. And like there was a there was a rain delay, and Les Miles is actually up there mixing it up, like holding court with all the LSU media. Uh -huh. And all that stuff. Like, you think Brian Kelly would be up Not there? Like, you know, like chance. chopping it up with, with the media in the press box? No. And that's my point. He's He waited until they were on the verge. Oh, you know, yeah. Had a chance to win a national championship. And now he's going to tweet out to the world, hey, just what you said. Hey, I'm going to watch him too. Yeah. It's like Jawan Howard was was there opening weekend when Michigan was there a few years ago. Why, why are you waiting until the end? Like, like show up. Show up. They've been there all week. Right. Show up earlier if you're going to actually watch him play. It, it, this is just so not who he is, and it's just so obvious, too. It's like, dude, just stay home because th this isn't who you are. You just 
want to get some credit for going out there on the private jet, going to a baseball game, and then coming home. I, I, I guarantee you he didn't spend the night. I bet you he's not there tonight. I'm just saying. I highly doubt he's there tonight. Yeah, unless they we'll flew see. back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> I just it, – it is such a stunt for him because it's just not who he is. It's just yeah. not. We expect that out of Marcus Freeman now because he goes to everything. He's actually like, been there. Yeah. All the, and he – yes, exactly. He goes to the regular season games. Right. He goes to the conference championship type stuff. He goes to the postseason. Like, he actually does all of these different things. So we expect it. Brian Kelly doesn't do that. It's It's – it's so pathetic is what it is. And anybody that believes it is just there. It's ridiculous. I've got, I've got a question. I'm going to spring on you. I oh, didn't, yes. I Love didn't put these. this on the list. So this, this is to your baseball coaching background. Okay. <sighs> okay. So LSU ace pitcher, Paul Skeens. Yeah. He's going to be the number one pick in the, in the draft here in a week or two, whenever I think it's about maybe a week and a half, two weeks away. He's going to yep. be the number one pick. He just threw 120 pitches in an elimination game Thursday night. So he's had like three and a half days rest, something like that. So my question is, would you pitch him tonight? And if so, when would you use him? How would you use him? Uh, he'd start. Like, I, sorry, you're starting. Um, you've had three and a half days rest, almost four days. That's just one day less than you would have. I would, I would have a conversation with him, but I'd be like, hey, you're our guy. And I, I realize you got the draft coming up and, and all of that. And I would have that conversation with him. But if he's the guy who I think he is, he wants the ball. And I'm going to give him the ball. 100%. I'm putting my best lineup on the field when you take the field in game three. There's no more games after this. That's it. He went exactly. to college for a reason. You've got as much rest as you need after tonight. Yeah. Absolutely. That's exactly the way I would look at it. I think I, you know, one, you have the conversation with him, obviously, because yeah, you make I sure, would. because like in the course of a, like a regular season, especially if you've pitched like Skeens has pitched this year, you know, he's been the, again, he's going to be the number one pick. He's sure. been the best pitcher in college baseball. Like he's got a pro body though, you know, like he's right. big and strong and like he's a hoss and all that. So, you know, like, so you have a conversation first. I don't know if I would start him. I think like, you know, like with the way that, that baseball has gone with the analytics, you know, like you have an opener and stuff like sure. that, you know, like Tampa has used a lot of opener, you know, like, do you maybe say, okay, you're going to be the opener and you'll go for as, you know, as long as you're comfortable. I think what I would do because of the power arm that he's got is I would save him like I would start somebody else probably, but one time through the him. lineup kind of a thing. Well, like save him for the first, you know, big situation, first high leverage situation that comes up in the game. Like if it's, you know, a one run game or maybe even, you know, I'm down by a run or something, but all of a sudden Florida's coming on and, you know, they've got a couple guys on base and nobody out or something like that. Bring in the big gun right out of the bullpen type thing or if like you're I getting that. Through the, or if like you're getting through the game like I wouldn't so I guess my point is I wouldn't save him just for a save situation right. first high leverage situation that comes up where I need somebody who's going to come in with a power arm throw 100 miles an hour and get me you know any anywhere between three and six outs then I would use it you know if it, if, if if it turns out that you save him for a save situation fine but I would oh, bring him in the first high leverage outs. situation Oof. Yeah, I if if I didn't start him, and that's a huge if because I would start him. Um, I would let whoever my second best pitcher, you know, whatever whoever's next, right? They get one time through the lineup, and then when you get to the second time through the lineup, then that's when I would bring him in, right? So that would be in potentially third yeah. inning, fourth inning. So you, know, you would go potentially nine outs then, like if you're going to go all the way through the lineup, is what you're saying, right? Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Yep, potentially could be could be less depending on right. How, I mean, obviously you know, they can get a couple hitting. hits and yeah, right. Like then that, decreases. but that's it. I mean, that's that's the least amount of time possible that I would not have him in the game. You know, like again, I'm starting him. I Romlock, he's Vince's conversation. You're starting. Like that would be pretty close. And, 
And no, this is not what I'm saying. I'm holding you out to her losing. No, I'm saying, I'm saying if it if they're on the verge and it's a one run game, but they're getting, you know, they've got a couple guys on now, and now you need someone who's going to end sure. this threat. I would bring him in so that it doesn't turn into a three or four or five run game. That's what I'm right. saying. Yep, I get that. <laughs> Anthony says, putting him following the dude who throws 80 is a change of pace. I don't know if anyone throws 80 in his court. going to say, but... <laughs> that's not, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's uh, Brian says, since we're on the BK topic and now that some time has passed, when did you know, and this is a super chat, by the way. Thank you, Brian, uh, Thanks, Brian, Brian. Steven. When did you know BK was not the coach to lead us back to a national championship? The day I met Brian Driscoll. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I'm kind of a Pollyanna when it comes to a lot of things. When it you know when it comes to like Notre Dame no, football, not I you. I know. I'm not like you. Oh, no. Come on, we can do it. We can do it. I, but there was a lot of stuff behind the scenes that obviously gave me pause. It, you know, the 2016 season obviously wasn't good. Um, that there was even post 2016 when all of the changes were forced upon Brian Kelly by Jack Swarbrick, and he made all those coaching changes and all of those different things. It still didn't feel to me like he was all in. You know what I mean? Like he he was in he was in butt saving mode at that point, point. Um, and so probably around then, I guess for me, more or less, um, there was always just that air of this isn't perfect, uh, and there's something going on. You know what I mean? So I would say any 2016 and on for me. Interesting. So like getting to the playoffs twice, you know, didn't. It just never – like, did you ever have confidence they were going to win that playoff game? Well – I didn't. I, I really didn't. And then they at least had a shot. I would say after losing the second one, you know, and again, it's like it, it felt like he played that to make it look as, you know, respectable mm -hmm. as possible. Yeah. That's really where it clicked for me. And, it's, and, and you know, as soon as he got defensive – you know, in the post game, you know, with the yeah. question about closing the gap because it was obvious that a gap still needed to be closed. Right. And then, you know, the more he started, you know, again, talking about, you know, shopping down a different aisle and blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. And the all excuses that kind of stuff. were flying. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, you know, recruiting did get better after 2016, which is something that I always, you know, kind of marveled at the fact that they were able, you know, to 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 you know to raise the level but that was like by the time they lost the second one in 2020 to Alabama after obviously losing a lopsided game to a full strength Clemson team prior to that so back to back games you know you lose games in that fashion and then you look at at where recruiting went you know did it get better well it got maybe a little bit better but they really and I, I always thought it was going to be a hard task to get someone who could come in, win games at the level he was able to win games, you know, mm -hmm. post yeah. 2016, but also be able to continue to raise the bar from a recruiting standpoint. Yeah. So far, Marcus Freeman has done much better from a recruiting standpoint than Brian Kelly did. Now, he's still got to prove that he can win the games sure. that he's supposed to. That's still yeah. going to be gotta close on some, Freeman. And they got to close on some big-time recruits. Right. You know, they're still – I but think again, that question mark is still out there. But, again, a week ago, remember we're talking blue-chip mm -hmm. ratio. Absolutely. Tonight. And when you look at those numbers over the last yep. three years, Marcus Freeman has – yeah. has been turning in much better blue chip ratios. And Absolutely. that's what Brian Kelly needed to do. But yeah. he, you know, he chose to shop down a different. And, and so the long and the short of it is after 2020, that's that was kind of my cutoff point, I think. Okay, today. fair enough. Yeah, I, I think Marcus Freeman, from a recruiting standpoint, and we talked about this during the blue chip ratio conversation, it's basically his base of recruiting is higher than Brian Kelly's base of recruiting i still need to see marcus freeman get some of those blue not blue chippers because that's not accurate but like a couple of those five-star kids you know what i mean right. just 
couple of the Justin Scotts, you know, the the whatevers, the Peyton Bowens, you know, those are the just names mm-hmm. I'll throw out there. Like he pulls in a couple of those to add to the majority of four star guys that he's bringing in. Now you're talking really, really good. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're talking top three class every year. Like Bryant or like Anthony is saying here, Kelly was adept at beating the teams. He had more talent at the time they played. And that's exactly, you know, that's, that's why, you know, again, that's why, you know, like people go back to, you know, Tulsa and USF and, and stuff like that. Though, you know, by, by 2017, that was a thing of the past. 2017 sure. to 2021, he was winning all those games, but he also had more talent than all those teams. Who was the teams that he was losing to? the teams that had more talent, the teams that were recruiting at a much more elite level. And that's where they needed to get if they were truly going to turn the corner. But he was more interested in, right? you know. Ten wins. He was was very happy with ten wins. Like that's that's who he ended up being. And I will say, I will give him all the credit in the world for getting this program back to a place where they were winning those games on a regular basis. No doubt about it. If I'm splitting hairs – the manner in which he won those games still left something to be desired. If you want to be an upper echelon team, you got to beat those teams down. And he was always worried about what other people thought of him, what other coaches thought of him, what the right. media thought of him. The whole, I'm he, tired of being the nice guy. And it's like, well, stop being the nice guy. Yeah, exactly. You're not really a nice guy to begin with. So <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Right. So, like, why were those games as close as they were? Now, he was winning them. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. But he wasn't winning them the way he needed to win them. So, again, I'm splitting hairs, and I get that. But I'm hoping that Marcus Freeman wins those games, but wins them like a top five team needs to win them, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I agree with this, Chi-Town. Team, he says he's Team Freeman, but BK would not have lost to Marshall or Stanford. Okay. I I do believe that. I agree with that wholeheartedly. But he lost to those teams when he first started at Notre Dame. I mean, th- yeah, I mean that's that's fair. But he's saying like if this were last year, and BK my and, and Brian been, Kelly was the coach, absolutely, he had twenty three right. years if of head Brian Kelly experience. was still the coach last year. Right, he had twenty plus years as a head coach. They were at to least fall going back to on. another. They were at least going to another Fiesta Bowl or Sugar Bowl or whatever. Absolutely, you know? no, I, I will one hundred percent agree with but that. But they probably still lose to Ohio State, maybe yep. Mike by more, and yep. they probably still lose to USC. Although, absolutely. even that one, that one would have been interesting because you've still got Marcus Freeman as the, as defensive, the defensive coordinator. coordinator. Yeah. You know, like, like. You know, I, I don't think Marcus Freeman tries to drastically alter his defensive system for a one-off against USC the way Al Golden did last year. And that was covered in, in the, you know, the, the questions that Brian had with Marcus Freeman in, in the latest story that he had about the defense. No, I okay. That was, that yeah, was, I, you know, so. when, when Brian Kelly took over at Notre Dame, he still had – I don't remember, 15, 20 years as a head coach under his belt, and he still lost to Tulsa and USF and teams like that. You know what I mean? Marcus Freeman had zero years of head coaching experience, and he lost to Stanford and Marshall. Like, you know, I'm not forgiving that. He should not have lost to those teams, but Brian Kelly shouldn't have lost to those teams when he first started out at Notre Dame either. You know what I mean? So, again, I'm not forgiving the loss, but I'm saying everybody that says, well, Brian Kelly would have won those games – Yes, I agree with you. He would have won those games, but he didn't win those games when he first started at Notre Dame. Right. Right. And I mean, he had even much more experience as a head coach than Marcus Freeman had. You know, and that's right. You know, again, it's it's it seems like Marcus Freeman got his ship righted as the season went on, but the only sure. way we're gonna find out for sure is this is year in action. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. There, Are there still going to be some games that are going to sneak up and bite him in the butt? That's yeah, still jury's still out. Jury's right. still out. Look, I'm a huge Marcus Freeman fan. I'll be the first one to say it, but the jury's still out as to can you win the games you're supposed to win, and can you win them the right way, and then can you win the big ones? I don't know. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. That's, you know, it's a, it is a good question. Like, would Tyler Buckner have even been the starting quarterback? Would it have been Drew Pine from the good beginning? Question. Because he was obviously very similar to Ian Book. And, you know, that's Brian Kelly showed that he liked that style of quarterback. 
Mm-hmm. Really good question, but we'll never know. We will never know unless Brian <laughs> Kelly ends up at Arizona State. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we will end it with that tonight. We got some bonus Notre Dame questions in there. Enjoyed those. Thanks for bringing them. Thanks for the super chats once again. And we will be back tomorrow. We've got some uh, Professor Jesse coming in tomorrow. I don't know what we're going to talk about tomorrow. We'll figure something out, though. Yeah. Got plenty of time. You got like 23 hours to to figure it out. I can't believe the 4th of July is next week. June's almost over. (sighs) Can't wait. Vacation, baby. Do you remember the days when you had to schedule your vacation around moratorium and high school schedules? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's where I'm at. <laughs> that's right. That's where now I'm I got to Now I got to try to schedule it around training camp, and that doesn't even always work out. So, <laughs> Yeah, blame the Ireland trip, buddy. Mm-hmm. All right, we'll hit the like button on your way out. We do appreciate it. And, of course, subscribe, rate, and review. Leave us a comment on uh, your podcast platform, and we will talk to you manana on IB Nation Sports Talk.